I am Diane Lukis and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I've read for the last 40 years and today I have my special guest. He is award-winning author and of course best-selling author to no other than Mr. Gerald Everett Jones. Well, thank you, Daniel. It's good to join you this morning. Thank you for your time, Mr. Gerald. And can you please introduce yourself? Well, I'm a freelance writer. I have been a writer most of my working life, although there have been times that I have, as they say, flown a desk. <laughs> so <laughs> I have some business background, but I have, I'm just about to release my 14th novel, and that is Preacher Stalls the Second Coming. That is the fourth book in the Preacher Evan Wycliffe Mystery Series, which has won multiple awards. And the thing I think that's most notable about this series is that Preacher Evan Wycliffe is a, uh, a young man, relatively young man, 30-ish young man in southern Missouri in rural rural area and he has an obsessively curious mind uh, some people even call him agnostic because um, at times he sounds like a doubter he went to harvard divinity school dropped out when he found out too much about the christian church enrolled in mit in astrophysics and felt as though he didn't get too many good answers that way either so he's back in his hometown of Appleton City, Missouri, which is just north of the Ozarks. And in the beginning, in the in the first book in the series, he he really isn't a minister, he's just a guest preacher. He can just get a part-time job. But he finds that people are bringing, in the small town, people are bringing problems to him that nobody else wants to solve. And so, especially when this involves unfairness or even evil directed at somebody within his own um, congregation, he feels honor bound to, to find out what's going on. So uh, that, that's the engine, if you will, the engine of drama. And in this fourth installment, you've got a cult leader, if you will, a, 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 a famous evangelist who is actually luring people to his retreat. It's a large uh, acreage farm. He's luring people there on the promise of food. And, you know, they're often disadvantaged people, homeless people. And if they have some grain of faith or whatever, they, they follow him into this place. But then once they're there, he's encouraging them to fast and even to starve so that they'll face the last days. Now, at the same time, um, he, it appears as though he may be hatching a plot to actually fake the second coming of Christ. Now, interestingly enough, and one of the things that started this story was that there actually was a plot to do that in the, uh, in the U.S. intelligence community back in the early 1960s. They were going to have a submarine off the coast of Cuba shoot off a bunch of fireworks and special effects and loudspeaker, but they wanted to convince faithful Cubans that Fidel Castro was the Antichrist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that would overthrow him. Now that plan went nowhere along with, they had other plans like give him a su exploding cigar or, you know, poison his coffee, but none of that took place. But then years later, and it was in the 1990s, I believe, there has been a whole conspiracy theory that has been circulated. They resurrected this idea, and the, the conspiracy theorists seem to think that NASA is combining with the deep state, and yes, they're going to use some advanced virtual reality to, uh, to convince people you know, that Jesus has come again. So these elements... Uh, go together in the plot 
and and again, it's it's a matter of one of uh, Evans' congregation being disappearing inside the place, a, a young woman, and um, he he really feels as though he's got to he's got to dig into it. And the you know the local sheriff is saying, well, you know, it's a religious retreat. You know, we don't want to go in there. And what if they got a lot of weapons? And you know, the, right now it doesn't look like they're hurting anybody. And the you know politicians are saying, well, you know the homeless people are kind of disappearing from the cities. This isn't all bad. So nobody has any interest in stopping this guy uh, until um, it turns out some people are, have actually expired there. So that's the, that's the engine of drama in this particular uh, one. And I would say throughout the, throughout the series, the, the four, four books so far, I'd say the basic question is, uh, in Evan's mind, as it is for many people, is why is there evil in the world and, and why do bad things happen to good people? And I, I don't know that there are good answers to that, but I know that Evan stays awake nights uh, <laughs> trying, <laughs> try, trying to find the answers to those questions. And I'd say also one of the things that makes Evan a talented, uh, effective investigator when other people have given up is the fact that he is... He's something of a techie. He's something of a of a geek. He's a data driller. So his other part time job in the beginning, besides being guest minister, I mean, he only got <laughs> fifty bucks a sermon, right? Uh, but in the very beginning, when he was doing it, um, he actually worked as a skip tracer. Now, you know, skip tracer, you know, looks for tracks down like a detective. Uh, people who have skipped on their obligations, on their loans. So he's working for the local Ford dealership <laughs> to wow. try, try to locate people who are, you know, several months behind in their payments. And of course, one of the things that drives the, the car dealer crazy is that Evan often works out win-win deals <laughs> <laughs> that are better than, than, than the guy thought of. And, you know, the, the person ends up keeping the car in, in one case, in one case, Evan was driving a demonstrator that was, it was kind of a beat up, kind of beat up. It was like a car that nobody else wanted to drive, okay? And so he tracks down this woman and she's, you know, she's um, um, she's ex-military, she's kind of down on her luck and and actually what, what she owes for is the payments on the Mustang that her boyfriend took off in, okay? Because she'd co-signed for him. So she didn't even have a car. <laughs> <laughs> so so evan so evan gives her the loaner <laughs> cuts down the amount of the loan to what she can afford <laughs> he goes home <laughs> oh sounds interesting mr gerald but at what age did you realize that you're good in writing well i won a short story contest when i was in fourth grade uh, and then I won another one when I was in sixth grade. So, uh, wow! But then the other the other aspect of it is um, I was raised a Southern Baptist, and I would say now maybe I'm. Would you call me New Age or an I don't knowist or you know, whatever? But um, but also I had um, a lot of schooling in science. And my father was an engineer and really wanted me to be a research scientist. And it disappointed him greatly when in high school I decided, you know something, I think I want to write. And it's like, uh-oh, nobody makes money doing that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I also, I, I, will, I will also tell you, uh, I began my career writing um, advertising and corporate uh, training uh, films. And from there, I went into the very early days of computer graphics, back when it took an entire room uh, of computers to, to create a slide, color slide. That gave me enough background in computer technology that when I took the opportunity to begin to write um, books and textbooks, I did a lot of how-to books in the early days of PCs. I wrote books on Excel, on, on PowerPoint, on, um, I, have a, I have a book that's still taught in universities called How to Lie with Charts. <laughs> <laughs>
So if there's if there are government uh, people lying to you, then it might be my fault because uh, it's taught at Georgetown, or at least it, it used to be. I don't know if it still is. Um, but so I, I I wrote business and technical technical books for really most of my career. It was only in the last oh ten or fifteen years that I turned to writing fiction, and my my book agent said, "Well, you know, can't help you with that." <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah it's been a bit of an uphill struggle but um i you know you i guess you'd call me a mid-list author i you know i'm i've got a few thousand fans so life is good that'd be awesome life is good so how does it feel that you won a nine book awards in just one year Well, the nine book awards are for, uh, and that was actually over a few years for the Evan Wycliffe series. Uh, in total, I believe, I think I've won 20, more than 20 book awards. Um, I will say that the most gratifying of those, there's the New York City Big Book Awards, which um, permits entries from not only small presses like mine, but also uh, the big five publishers. So you're competing against everybody. And uh, in one year, that was 2020, uh, I had entered two books. I had entered um, the, the first book in the series, Preacher Finds a Corpse, and the second book in the series, Preacher Fakes a Miracle. And in that year, I won gold and silver. I won the top two awards for those two books. And so I can legitimately say I'm better than everybody. <laughs> <laughs> at, least according, at least according to the judges of the New York City Big Book Awards. Definitely legit that you are the best of the best. Yeah, yeah. I might, I, and, and my, my, uh, um, uh, my, my relative even, um, Uh, for for a gift, uh, got me a cup engraved. You know, best of all mystery writers. <laughs> so who are your favorite authors that influence you the most? Well, you know, I have read absolutely everything that John le Carre wrote. And I would say he has to be uh, the one that I admire the most. And the reason, I think the main reason is in his spy novels, he refers to people in the espionage intelligence game as close observers. And this is people who they pick up details like sponges and, you know, that makes them talented investigators because, because the other term is junkyard mind, you know, it's always got stuff just collecting whatever you can. And I apply that skill in, um, In, in the preacher series, because you know Evan is is curious and he, and he, he there's no such thing as an insignificant detail, it may come become useful later, but the thing that really impresses me about Lacare's work is that he will give you just a boatload of details, but you don't know which one of those is going to become important later, and he teaches you like the spies to be a close observer that's what a reader is is a close observer and a, a, someone who a, who enjoys and is intrigued by that process of discovery so i will i would say john le Carre taught me to read between the lines and i think that that is an amazing an amazing achievement on his part because many of his books it's like you haven't you have a an instinct about what's going on you have a suspicion you but it's never really it's never really expressed maybe even after you finish the book it's never fully expressed uh as to what was going on behind the scenes but it does give you because you know he's very much about you know corruption in government and international geopolitics and false he, he detests false flag operations that's that's what that um that's what that uh, plot against Castro was, was what they would call a false flag operation. And um, yeah, there have been a lot of those and most of them um, are what they would call cock-ups, just, you know, failed plans from somebody who thought they were too smart. 
Definitely. So, Mr. Gerald, what is the most rewarding aspect of being an author? Well, I will say, without hesitation, it's being able to take the material that's in your own life, especially the things that might distress you or have upset you or things that you are puzzled about that you can't really connect the dots and turn that into fiction, express yourself. And it's, it's, it's the most marvelous form of therapy in the world. Plus, you know, there was a very famous, uh, it was William Goldman, the screenwriter who said, everything in your life is fiction. Everything in your life is material. If you just live long enough to use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I haven't run out of material yet. <laughs> Sounds interesting. More, more books to come. But before we go on, Mr. Gerald, I want to shout out to the people listening according to my ranking tops in the last 30 days because according to Pad status, because in Jamaica, I got number one on the Apple chart. Cameroon at number five, Zambia at number nine, Cambodia 31, Japan. I think it's time as hike number 49. Thank you, Japan. Malaysia at 66. Wow. Egypt at 97. And Malawi at number 20. United Republic of Tanzania at 87. <laughs> Tanzania. Alge yes, Tanzania. Algeria at 102. And of course, I have a lot more. Norway at 166. Vietnam at 167. India at 186. And a lot more. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast. Because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world, like Mr. Gerald Everett Jones. Impressive, impressive, Daniel. I, I lived in Kenya for two years, and actually I entered Kenya from Tanzania, so uh, I can say I've put my feet in the absolute middle of East Africa. <laughs> Oh, that's be awesome. So, Mr. Gerald, let's talk about your upcoming novel, Preacher Stole the Second Coming. How did you craft that? Well, uh, this had to do with extending the plot lines that had taken place in the first three books. It, it is a chronology. We are, we, there is an arc of Evan Wycliffe's personality that goes from his beginnings where uh, in, in investigative beginnings where he is, he doesn't, he's not really a minister. He's mucking about with um, odd jobs in Southern Missouri, but then actually in the later books, um, his, the, the fellow who's the, uh, the old, the old fellow who's the pastor of the uh, local Baptist church decides he wants to retire. And that's right at the beginning of COVID. And so he, he, he basically orders Evan to step in and become a full-time uh, minister of that church. So that means that during COVID, Evan's got to go on compassionate visits to hospitals. He's got to conduct weddings and funerals. And, and uh, you know, this is all during the time of pandemic. And in that book, that's Preacher Raises the Dead, the third one, um, he's gotten married. And uh, that woman um, uh, had had a difficult background as a, as it turns out, as a cocktail waitress at the local casino. But when she becomes Evan's wife, she's, she's just like a really conscientious church lady. And one of the things that's happening is it's like too much strain on her. It's a harder job than being minister. She's running the what they call the Loving Embrace Committee. So she's basically cooking meals for, you know, people who are, are uh, you know, housebound and uh, and, uh, and and you know, and planning events, uh, you know, where they're, uh, uh, you know, garnering uh, used clothing for the homeless. And you know, she's just like up to her neck, and that creates a huge amount of stress. And then. And then she's in an auto accident and she ends up being somebody who Evan has to visit her bedside um, in the hospital. So it becomes, and you know, that's the right, that's the reference to pre Preacher Raises the Dead because um, in some ways, some people in town 
seem to think of him as a faith healer because you know the people who make it you know are, he's visiting everybody some some of them make it so oh yes sounds interesting mr gerald so how did you come up with the title for this book preachers thoughts post the second coming well of course part of this unscrupulous evangelist plan is to fake the second coming uh, and so I didn't want to say that Evan prevents the second coming because some people look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 we we do want to. Um, uh, it's it's not much of a spoiler to say that um, it didn't happen uh, during you know <laughs> the plot of this book. So that's that's where the title comes from. Could you describe the main characters or themes on your book that readers can look for what to? Well, Preacher Evan Wycliffe is, I think, a, oh, I mean, in in many ways, uh, modeled on myself in that he he's had a fundamentalist background and a lot of uh, training in theology and in science. And so he's something of a skeptical observer. And I think that makes him a great investigator. And he cares about people. He, he cares about trying to confront the injustices, and but he, one of his one of his close colleagues in town is 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 Sheriff Otis, uh, who's trying to hold down a job. Uh, you know, as a, 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 a black lawman in 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 the middle of a state where it, you know, it, it's difficult. For to hold positions of authority at times, if you're, you know, in, in, in non-white, if you will, and um, and then there's Marcus Thur Thurston, who's also black, who's the, uh, the the retired pastor, but uh, Evan sees his Evan sees him as a father figure. He's something of a wise fellow, and um, uh, and then I, I one of the most colorful characters is. Um, Coralie Angelides, and she's the waitress at the local diner that come on in. <laughs> oh, wow. And that, that's the meeting place for everybody in town. And of course, it's a great place where Evan, you know, can soak up gossip and eat pancakes. So. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Did you draw from any personal experiences when drafting the story or characters? Well, that part of Southern Missouri around Appleton City, Rockville, is where my family's from two generations back. And as a boy, I, I, uh, I was taken down there to learn to hunt and fish and rode a horse a couple of times and didn't really become a horseman there. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we'd... Um, as boys, we'd chase the sheep and... and you know, there'd be ducks running around the farm. We'd chase them. And um, so, yeah, I'm familiar with that part of the world. Also, that's just north of Lake of the Ozarks, and which has become very much a... Um, it's actually two lakes. There's Truman Lake and Lake of the Ozarks itself. Those are both dammed up uh, rivers um, years ago. But Lake of the Ozarks has become very much a recreational destination uh, you know, motorboats and jet skis and that kind of thing, and uh, casinos also. And then uh, Truman Lake is more sedate. I mean, it's just just as almost as large as Lake of the Ozarks, but you will find it. That would be where the rowboats and the fishermen are <laughs> uh, <laughs> on Truman Lake. Yeah. They don't not not they don't like jet skis very much on Truman Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, Mr. Gerald, what do you hope readers will take away from your book after they finish reading it? I think the most valuable thing that readers can pick up, and I think that that's true of what can be imparted to to school children, is is curiosity. You know, if somebody becomes curious and obsessively curious. These days, access to information is just so easy. Now, you've got to be critical in terms of, is this valid information or is, is this trustworthy information? Now, that's going to, that might take some research, okay? But, I, but in terms of being able to 
just simply investigate anything that intrigues you. I mean, one of the things that just is so amazing to me is the James Webb telescope. I mean, that that is now a million miles out in a parking orbit, and it's studying the very edge of the universe using infrared um, uh, rays. And we're seeing that the, you know, when I was in grade school, the science lessons were about this. There was like the solar system and then eh, there's a few stars, right? Uh, yes. Oh, and well, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there, yeah, there's the same Milky Way, but it's a long way away. It's really big. Now we find that there are what? Trillions of stars, billions of galaxies. It, it's just, it's astounding. And then when we think about, uh, which, which I think is also something that should make us um, just appreciate the, the value of, of our life and our existence is that the molecules that are in our bodies had to be manufactured in stars, inside stars, in nuclear fires. Those, in order for those molecules to exist, it took millions in some cases, billions of years. To so the, those molecules are the same as way back when, and they will, once we're gone, they will return to the earth and none of it will be destroyed. I think it was, um, I mean, well, someday it may become dust, but uh, that's something else again. But the um, uh, there, there was a statistic, I believe, I, I believe I read it in Bob Bryson's book. And he said, every breath you take, the likelihood is there's at least one molecule Julius Caesar breathed. <laughs> it's like everything is shared. Everything is shared. You're, you, you, your body has just borrowed these molecules and your body, your body renews itself every seven years. So you're not even the same person that you were seven years ago. Definitely. So, Mr. Gerald, how would you balance science and religion in your novel? I think you do have to appreciate both, but you have to think about point of view and perspective. And that is science can tell you things that can be empirically proven, things that can be demonstrated and repeated and repeated and repeated no matter how many different experimenters try it. That's the basic basis of science. And that can change because as soon as you have different instruments, new technologies, what you observe before might, 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 what you observe now might be much more insightful and complex than what you could observe you know, you know it, observing with an optical microscope, you're going to see certain things. Observing with an electron microscope, you're going to see entirely different things. And so your 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 theories have to be refined. Science isn't something that just is cast in stone. It's something that's changing all the time. And I would say with religion, you have the ability to think beyond what science can speculate about because now there's been a lot of research on the nature of consciousness. And I've read a lot of scientific literature with neurologists who are, and biochemists who are trying to figure out how does consciousness arise? And there are, there are scientists today who claim that, you know, consciousness isn't something that, that can be produced inside a computer, no matter how complex the computer is. Consciousness is something that exists apart from the human body. Consciousness is like radio waves that our brain receives. This is astounding. And this, is, this, this sounds a whole lot more like religion than it does like theology, okay? I mean, like, like um, science. So uh, that, that kind of thing fascinates me is that I don't know that, that, the, that the borderline between science and religion is quite as fixed as some people might think. I think that there's a lot of um, gray area <laughs> in there. Yes. There's room There's room for doubt, and doubt's not necessarily a bad thing. Definitely. 
Sister Gerald, how do you think preachers told the second coming stands out in its genre or category? Well, I would say a lot of mysteries, especially what you might call pulp novels or um, uh, series where there's just a lot of titles. I mean, thir maybe 30 titles, something like that in a series of some authors. Those tend to be entertainment. They're, they're, they're like uh, narrative crossword puzzles. You know, there's you 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 read it and you you know like 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 snack food and it's time to go on to the next one. This series is not like that. This series is more about trying to ask difficult questions about you know again like I said, why is there evil in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? No book is going to give you that answer. I mean, even even. Even the Bible doesn't spell that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quite, quite that. Or, or let's put it this way: it spells it out multiple times, but each in a different way. And you know, it's not exactly a, a consistent message all the way through, uh, especially Old Testament, New Testament, and especially you know, from well, even from one gospel to the next, they're they're not they're not the same. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't mean there isn't value there. Um, that this is, you know, a collective wisdom of, of the human race. So, uh, uh, not to be, um, not to be uh, uh, trivialized or, 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 you know, it's to be respected. To be respected, I would say. Certainly, very well said, Mister Gerald. So, what advice would you give to aspiring authors who are looking to embark on their own writing journeys? I would give different advice to fiction writers than I would give to nonfiction writers. And have, I've done, you know, a lot of each. In nonfiction, when I wrote business and technical books, and most of that was for mainstream publishers, um, I had to submit a book proposal with an outline. You know, it would, it was, a uh, you know, bullet points for each chapter um, of the book. And I would be assigned an editor. And if I, departed from that out outline, uh, <laughs> I had to say, mother, may I, and explain to the editor, you know, why I had to make the change. And they didn't like, they never really, once I, once the outline was approved, they really didn't like me de departing from the outline. So nonfiction is very structured and it does behoove you to have an outline to begin with and to write to the outline and to research your points and make sure that they are cross-checked and valid and whatever. But I will say when you write fiction, trust that you can get beyond the blank page. And I will say that once you create characters in fiction, don't be surprised if they go where they want to go if and if they don't say the things that they want to say that surprise even you. And I will say that that's, that can be a confusing process, uh, allowing that to happen, basically allowing your subconscious mind to, to construct things. But I will also say that that is the absolute best way to write things like mystery novels because if I can surprise myself, I can delight the reader. Because if I didn't know what was coming, they probably won't know either. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But before we go on, Mr. Gerald, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Food 101, our fourth season with Chef Alessandro, one of the best executive chef in one of the best restaurant or five-star restaurant in downtown Toronto. So please do listen. And one more, our books are out, not only one, but 13 volumes, people. Food 101, volume one, basics until 13 is only the books that you need, how to create a delicious food. Available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So, Mr. Gerald, if you go back and give advice to yourself, when you were first starting out as a writer, what would it be? Well, it helps to have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, it's very similar to, you know, if you're an actor, maybe you're waiting tables or driving a cab. Um, I had, 
uh, when I when I was really beginning to write uh, books for a living, I I edited a series of college textbooks, and they were in um, computer science. So that was incredibly good training, not only from the standpoint of just simply style and grammar, uh, putting sentences together, but also in terms of just discipline. Uh, you know, and the, and the editor that I worked for there was said, you know, there's one way to write. Get your butt in a chair every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Stop procrastinating. <laughs> Uh, and write and write and write. Who knows you will be well? And the other the other thing it may sound obvious, but you have to like being with yourself. You have the passion of what you are doing, like Mr. Gerald. So, lastly, where can our listeners find more about you and your work? There is my author website, Gerald with a G, Everett E V E R E T T. That's two T's. Jones Gerald Everett Jones dot com. And you, there you will find review co links to review copies of my books. You'll find an entire book list. You'll see biography. There'll be a link to my, I have a Substack blog with uh, 7,000 subscribers. Uh, not as many as your podcast, but, you know, <laughs> getting there, <laughs> getting there. So, yeah, my Substack, I have a, my Substack blog is called Thinking About Thinking. And uh, often I will review books that I found um, intriguing and often I will relate them to themes that I have developed in my own book so uh, especially literary fiction I, I, I read a lot of literary fiction uh, but also I, I read uh, historical fiction not so much science fiction although actually the next the next story I'm going to work on may may slip into science fiction I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that Preacher Stalls the Second Coming, even though it's got the virtual reality in it. I don't know what I would call it science fiction. It's th there's an element of technology, but it's not, you know, it's it's not really otherworldly from that standpoint. And you don't have to have read the the previous books in the series to appreciate this one, if especially if that topic and that that theme that storyline intrigues you. I've written all the books so that they're, they're, they're more or less standalone. I mean, certainly it will help you to understand the characters in the community that he's moving in. And it, it'd be like binge watching a, you know, a, a, a cable series, a streaming series is that the more that you know about that environment, the more that you might be intrigued and entertained by it. That'd be awesome. So it's good for a series or a motion picture. Oh my, I would say feature film, I think is in many ways is giving way to cable series because you have to compress a lot to get things into. I mean, look at what they did with Oppenheimer. Okay. They had a 700 page book and they crammed it into three hours. I, I don't know. I don't know how they did that. <laughs> okay. So, so it, but, but the thing that I've noticed about the relatively new, a platform of, of streaming series is that you can, if you're converting a book to a streaming series, you know, you can have a, an episode for every chapter. So, you know, you might have, you might have 13 episodes or, or might double up on chapters. Okay. that But, you know, you look at succession, how many, I mean, what was it? However many seasons it was. And one of the things I often say is, you know, when I used to walk out of a movie theater, um, I never said I miss those people. But if I if I binge watch a, you know, Succession or <laughs> or Ozark, Ozark set in the same place where you know the preacher finds a uh, corpse is, um, I you know after I've finished, it's like I'm really disappointed there aren't more episodes. I really miss those people. I miss those characters. And that's the way it used to be in the world of Balzac and Dickens. The, they were serialized in newspapers. There were, there were people waiting on the docks for the steamship to show up with the next batch of newspapers <laughs> so that they could read the next chapter of Dickens. It's, it's, it's a lot like that now with cable. I think it's wonderful. Definitely so, Mr. Gerald. Preacher Stole, The Second Coming, the number four in the award-winning mystery series, 
can you please invite our listeners to support all these books? You will develop some curiosity, I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. People, let's support Mr. Gerald for all the cities because if you support him, more, more books to come for <laughs> sure. Right, Mr. Gerald? Uh, halfway through the next one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> always be any... always be thinking ahead always be thinking ahead and thank you Fitch Fat, for being the number two best book podcast on the planet and number one in the art category thank you so much and my latest score of 26 and belong to 10% popular show globally thank you listen notes and Mr. Gerald thank you for your time thank you again Daniel so on. Morticon people, see you soon.